Hi everybody, welcome to this quick update. I am Josh Peck, and if you could, go ahead and subscribe to this channel if you have not already, and click the bell to turn on all notifications so you'll know whenever we upload a new video, which we've been able to do pretty frequently lately. Uh, so that's really good. Also, follow us if you're on Rumble. It really does help. So let's jump into it. Um, so the graviton, this is probably one of the strangest theoretical particles ever hypothesized. The gravitons have never been directly observed. However, physicists are confident in a soon discovery by means of particle colliders such as the LHC or Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, and they know they exist. They, I mean, they have to say hypothetical because they haven't observed one, but there's a gravitational field, which lends to a graviton particle, just like the electromagnetic field has the photon particle. Every field has an associated particle, so they can, they can be fairly sure that gravitons do exist. Now, gravitons, uh, in a sense, um, uh, are, are very mysterious in many respects, but due to scientific advancements, we may not be far off from the holy grail of physics, and that's definitive proof that the graviton actually exists. Now, what makes the graviton especially interesting is its apparent ability to flow free between uh, dimensions. And what this means is, if the theory is correct, gravity can travel to higher dimensions, and higher dimensions can affect gravity. Um, among other potential discoveries, the graviton is at the top of the LHC's to-do list. The idea is it's not always to look for the graviton itself, but to look for a gap where particles should be after a collision. And they explain this on the CERN website as well. The, the two particle detectors of the LHC, which are called CMS and ATLAS, are able to show us the aftermath of a particle collision. Uh, and as in any collision, debris is thrown out and uh, distributed fairly evenly. If, though, the detector shows a gap where debris or new and exotic particles should be, that would be evidence that they've escaped into a higher dimension. And there was a recent report that I talked about on a previous video about why CERN and NASA are obsessed with the, the eclipse. Um, there was a recent report that says that uh, they have noticed these these gaps, these missing particles, and the leading theory, uh, and apparently they've, they've done something in a simulation or they've done something to show effectively enough evidence to basically prove that this is the case, that these particles are escaping into a higher a higher dimension um which which if if that's what the article is saying i mean that's that's revolutionary that's that's absolutely mind boggling so we we live in weird times but there's an idea that and this has been talked about for years there's an idea that gravitons can be used as a way to communicate with beings of higher dimensions if they exist now that might sound like the stuff of popular science fiction such as in the movie interstellar but physicists today are seriously considering this possibility if gravitons are discovered and are used as a way to communicate with beings of uh, higher dimensions or par parallel universes, then it might be what tells us that we're not alone. Now, while many are waiting for a type of disclosure event in which you know otherworldly beings present themselves and their spacecraft to humanity, we might be surprised to find these beings presenting themselves in a much different way. And this may begin with an established communication via gra gravitons. I mean, the process is actually kind of simple. If they can uh, isolate gravitons and uh, alter their spin, then they could have one spin up, one spin down. They can create a binary code and send a string of gravitons, which naturally go into higher dimensions, into these higher dimensions, and then set up a detector wait, and, and just wait for a response. Uh, and that that's kind of frightening when you think about things like Revelation 9. So so let, let, let's look at this a little bit more. What would the world look like after interdimensional communication is established? Uh, well, we might have the answer in the, in the prophetic book of Revelation. So the prophet John writes in Revelation 9, 1 through 3, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, 
if this is the case, if if uh, if these things are extra dimensional beings, and I'm going to make a case for that, I, I, I believe they are. I believe that angels are extra dimensional, fallen angels as well. Um, and if that's what exists in these higher dimensions, then whether Sir knows it or not, if they're planning this gravitation uh, communication system, um, they are attempting to contact the these locusts and beings like them, whether they know it or not. Uh, so the first thing to notice in that passage that I just read is this is when the fifth uh, angel sounds. Uh, as I discuss in my books, Quantum Creation and Cherubim Chariots, which are available right now at prophecywatchers.com. If you're going to get any of my books, please get them from prophecywatchers.com. Uh, um, don't, don't, don't waste your money on Amazon and, and try, try to, try to give Amazon even more money than what they have. Uh, and, uh, and also some people might be wondering about Skywatch. For some reason, my books aren't in their store anymore. So that's all I'm going to say about that because I, I literally have zero information about it. Um, I, I just realized myself the other day. So just that, that's just the case. So the best place to go to get my books is, uh, prophecywatchers.com. Um, and, uh, the, yes, they are on Amazon, but I would discourage people from getting them, uh, on Amazon because why support Amazon when you can support a really good ministry. So uh, prophecywatchers.com. And those books, again, is uh, Quantum Creation and Cherubim Chariots. Now, um, there are times that numbers in the Bible can mean different things, and I explore the possibility of the number of cherubim faces in Ezekiel's vision, representing spatial dimensions, uh, and I talk about that in Cherubim Chariots. If we follow that logic, if, if that's true, if there's something there, we might have a reference to beings of an extra uh, dimension in the fifth trumpet of Revelation. And I've theorized that when the rebellious angels fell from heaven, they may have fallen to what we would call the fourth spatial dimension, the fourth dimension of space that's above our own. Um, and for reasons that I lay out in Cherubim Chariots, I believe that the, the, these, and these would be the good guys, the good guys, the, the good angels that Ezekiel saw with all the faces, uh, I believe those have to be at least fifth dimensional. And the, the reason for that is something that's called extra dimensional unfolding. And it actually goes to uh, show why to Ezekiel, the, the, the parts of these cherubim seem fused together. And uh, that, that's, that's a long, that's a long thing to get into. Um, but uh, it, it is a real thing. It, it's something that physics talks about. And, and I lay it all out in cherubim chariots. And actually, if you want a whole video on that, let me know, and I'll I'll, I'll be happy to do a whole video on it. But, uh, uh, so so we might have reference to beings of an extra dimension in in the fifth trumpet of Revelation. Now, I've theorized that um, uh, again that the fourth spatial dimension might be where these fallen angels, when they fell, that they fell to possibly. Uh, and again, my book's Quantum Creation, Cherubim Chariots at prophecywatchers.com. Now, I do not believe that the angel sounding the trumpet here is a fallen angel at all, but might be signaling that a fallen being is about to come into the picture. So the rest of uh, the first verse of Revelation 9 states, And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit, of the bottomless pit. Now, this is no ordinary star. According to our modern... Uh, vernacular, any star that would fall on the earth would utter, utterly destroy the earth. There does seem to be a connection between stars and angels, though, and at times the word star can actually represent an angel. And we see this alluded to in uh, Revelation one twenty, which states, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Um now that word angel could also be like like messenger, like a human messenger, um, but still we have the word angel there, so it's a possibility. And and we can also see that the star is a being of some sort because it says unto him was given the key. So for this star to be referred to as him, it shows it's a, it, it's a person of some sort. And I believe that this is uh, I believe this is a person or being of uh, four spatial dimensions rather than three. I think that this is most likely referring to a fallen angel. Possibly. You know, opinions are split on that. Now, 
Verse 2 tells us that the angel opened the bottomless pit with the key, and the word key comes from the Greek word kleos, and uh, it, and, and can be used uh, as a metaphor for authority. In a sense, this fallen angel uh, was given permission to open the bottomless pit. We also learn in Revelation 1.18 that Jesus himself held the keys of death and hell, so most likely it was Jesus who granted this authority. Now, at this point, we might ask, why would Jesus give permission for a fallen angel to open the bottomless pit? Uh, and if it is a fallen angel, and again, opinions are split on that, well, we find the answer in chapter 2 of the book of Joel. So let's read through this, starting in verse 2. Um, a day of darkness and glo gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a de desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so they shall run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, they leap like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array." For their face and people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one in his own ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run upon the wall, they shall climb up on the houses, they shall enter into uh, in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, who can abide it. All right, so there's many things that we can learn in this passage, but for uh, our purposes here, we only need to note a couple of things. First, um, as we'll see in later detail, notice that this army is described in many of the same ways as the Locust Army of Revelation 9. Could be the same, we don't know for sure. We also have the 200 million uh, horsemen army, that, that, that's a possibility, and we also have um, the angels that, and that, then these would be the good guys, but that bring, um, that bring people to judgment at the very end of the tribulation. Um, so th these are all possibilities that people are still trying to figure out. And, and so there is some debate there, but it, it, do it does sound a lot like the locust army of Revelation 9. Um, we also read in verse 8 of their immortality, you know, when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded, showing these are likely angelic in nature. And given the description of the circumstances surrounding these beings, you know, sun, moon, and stars are darkened, there's a cloud of thick darkness, etc. It seems to be the same locust beings from Revelation 9. Um, again, there are other, other ways to look at it, but that's at least a possibility. Also, notice that Joel 2.11 says that this is the Lord's army. Now, how can this be? Well, there are times, um, you know, an easy, an easy answer to that was if this is actually just the angelic army at the end of the tribulation, then, then that answers that. But what if, what if, what if we knew for sure that this was, uh, the Revelation 9 locust army? Well, there are times in the Bible that God will use the enemy for his own purposes. After all, he is ultimately in control of these things anyway. He can use them as he sees fit. For example, in the book of Exodus, we read that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's in Exodus 9.12. Uh, we also read later in Revelation chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 13, And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. So, you know, if these angels are bound, then clearly they're bound for a reason. They sinned. They 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 rebelled against God. And we know that there are there's no forgiveness for, for angels in the sense that we could have forgiveness. Uh and that that's another there's a there's a reason for that, but that would probably take too long to get into. So if if these are bound, these are fallen angels. Yet 
the Lord is still using them for his own purposes. So uh, so as we can see, there are times that the Lord will use the enemy to fulfill his own purposes, usually in the way of judgment. Uh, and I would imagine the locust army would be no different. Now, before they are unleashed into our world, the gravitational communication aspect becomes more obvious as we consider these prophecies. It is possible that the LHC at CERN will detect, or maybe already has, and we just don't know it yet. Um, they, they don't release all their findings Im immediately when they find it. Like when they discovered the Higgs boson, they discovered that actually six months, I think it was six months before an official announcement was made. Um, so it, it's possible that if they haven't already, that the LHC at CERN will detect evidence of gravitons, which in turn could lead to a communication device to higher dimensional entities. And after all, if you think about it like this, what particle but the graviton could best represent fallen angels? Uh, we even have reference to falling, an effect caused by gravity, in the description of the star slash angel that opens the bottomless pit. So this brings up uh, dark matter and extra dimensions, because gravity is wrapped up all in this. We know that there are spiritual things that exist, but most would be surprised to find out that those spiritual things, if they're extra dimensional, and I believe they are, uh, and, and again, I make, I make a, a case for that in quantum creation, um, well, those things would affect our gravity. And this might actually be the explanation for dark matter. So dark matter is something scientists... Uh, used to, to help explain certain anomalous gravitational effects in the universe. So basically, the behavior of gravity in the universe is not consistent with the amount of matter in the universe. Um, so the, the, essentially, there's not enough matter in galaxies for the gravity to keep the galaxy together. All galaxies should be flying apart, but they're not. So they wonder, where, where where's all this extra gravity coming from? Well, there must be mass... And uh, that, that that's creating it, and they call that dark matter. Well, if you had extra... Well, okay, so the way that gravity behaves would suggest that there is far more matter than what we can see, and this invisible matter is, is called dark matter, and it's widely accepted in the scientific community. Uh, now, dark energy is the term given to uh, this mysterious energy that causes the exponential expansion of the universe. It's estimated that the known universe contains 4.9% ordinary matter, 26.8% dark matter, and 68.3% dark energy. So th this means that 95.1% of the makeup of the entire universe is unseen, unknown, and a complete mystery. Now, the really interesting thing about dark matter is that whatever it is, it affects gravity in the known universe. And this interaction shows that something is definitely there, we just can't see it or directly observe it. So when considering dark matter, uh, I was brought back to my research for quantum creation. It, it, it is possible that dark matter is actually matter consisting of more spatial dimensions than the three that we can perceive. And the interesting thing about gravity, again, is that it is one of the only things that can traverse dimensions. Now, if there was an object of more than three spatial dimensions in our universe, we would not be able to see it, but we could detect its gravitational effects. So it's possible this is what's happening with dark matter. Uh, this is speculative, of course, but many theories in this field um, must be speculative due to, you know, just our lack of information. But uh, and, and even more uh, speculative theory is that everything in three dimensional existence is nothing more than three dimensional slices of objects of higher dimensions. So to help put this into perspective, uh, consider th think about placing a cube on a two dimensional area called Flatland. Now, to a two-dimensional flatlander, a being that has no up or down, but is is essentially flat and only has access to two dimensions, that's, that, that cube would look as though it was just a square, because he could only perceive one two-dimensional slice of it. However, um, they are only seeing a two-dimensional slice of a much larger three-dimensional object. Um, if a four-dimensional object were to breach our three dimensions of space, we would only see a three-dimensional slice and it would look three-dimensional, but we would only see one three-dimensional slice of it because of our limited perception. Now, the interesting thing about a two-dimensional plane is that it actually does have a thickness, but that thickness is so small that it's hardly even worth considering. 
the the thickness of a two dimensional plane is what's known as the Planck length, which is the smallest length that's possible. The Planck length is even smaller than physical particles themselves, incredibly smaller. And again, for more information on that, check out my book, Quantum Creation, at prophecywatchers.com. Uh, but consider what this would mean for a flatlander. If a flatlander particle physicist uh, wanted to observe what made up matter, he could look at the particles themselves, but he would only be seeing a two-dimensional slice of each particle. The flatlander would be led to the assumption that everything in existence is made of tiny circles, essentially. Well, the same could be said for us. We observe the particles that make up reality and assume everything is made up of tiny spheres, in a sense, uh, which in turn are made up of even smaller uh, strings through string theory, though those strings have not been uh, directly observed. Um, but what if we are making that same flawed assumption? What if the particles we are observing are actually three-dimensional slices of a four-dimensional object or even more dimensions? Um, now, again, speculative, but everything that we see in nature might only be slices of a much larger and higher dimensional reality. And this could help us understand Bible passages such as Hebrews 11.3, which says, Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So basically, the visible is made from the un uh, invisible. Well, how could that be? If there are extra dimensions of space and if there's matter in, in those dimensions, then it makes perfect sense. Now, to even stretch this further, it might even be possible that we ourselves are three-dimensional slices of higher dimensional of a higher dimensional construct. Um, you know, what we consider as the spirit or the soul might not be this wispy ghost that lives inside of us, but might actually be um, at least a slice, uh, a part of a three-dimensional construct. Um, and and this, this could help explain Ephesians 2, 5 through 6, which, which uh, states, even when we were dead in our tra trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, this passage seems to uh, seems to say that this seating in heaven has already taken place. It, it says, even when we were dead in our trespasses. Um, if that interpretation is correct, then from God's perspective, we, meaning those saved by Jesus Christ, are already there, already seated with Christ, which is uh, pretty amazing to think about. Now, next, I want to talk about the extra-dimensional locusts of the bottomless pit. Um, and I, I want to get more into that. But before I do... Um, I have a couple of quick updates, and I'll try to make this fast, but the first is that we are still accepting donations for this transition time that me and my family find ourselves in. So for those who ha haven't heard, if you're new to the channel, I have accepted a job at Prophecy Watchers, which for me is an absolute dream come true. Um, the challenging part is that we moved from Illinois to Oklahoma for this job, but we have a house in Illinois that still needs to sell. And we have a rental here in Oklahoma, meaning that every month until the house sells, we're paying a mortgage and a rental payment. Um, also, our son Nathan has a lot of specific needs regarding his health. He's a cancer survivor, but there's still a lot of issues. And none of that is covered by insurance. So we're having to pay out of pocket uh, for his all natural health needs. And I've, I've already talked a lot about that in other videos. So in this one, I'll, I'll just keep it brief. But uh, if you'd like to help us out, the best place is paypal.me slash Josh Peck Disclosure. And if you don't have PayPal, uh, you can donate to my cash app, which is dollar sign Josh Scott Peck, all one word. Uh, of course, I'm not demanding anyone donate. I'm not promising extra blessings from God or anything like that. If you do, uh, you're not obligated whatsoever. But I learned a long time ago that if you don't ask for help when you need it, you're actually depriving people of the opportunity and the joy to help, which you know a lot of people really enjoy doing. You're also depriving them of potential uh, rewards in, in heaven for things like that. So and again, I'm not the one making those promises at all. That, that's just stuff that's in the Bible. It's, uh, and, I, and I'm not, I'm, again, I, I can't emphasize this enough. I am not saying if you donate any money that you're going to get some extra blessing from God. I'm not saying that at all. Never will say that. Uh, I, I would never make promises for God like that. And you should never listen to anyone that does. Um, so if you feel led, uh, we could use your help for sure, uh, whether financially or through prayer. Uh, and that would be greatly appreciated. Um, 
And I, I also want to say, too, uh, in response to a couple of comments that I saw online, of course, Prophecy Watchers is absolutely helping us out very generously. They have been awesome. Um, but without not, without knowing how long the house will take to sell, uh, you know, what health issues might come up with Nathan or all, all of the other untold number of variables, I don't know as of now how much we need or how long this will last. So I figured the best thing to do, because God knows and I don't, the best thing to do is to put the need out there to all of you and allow God to direct those who would like to give. So that's all this is. Um, uh, and I also do have those donation links in the description below. Um, I also have to tell you about DailyRenegade.com, which is the official website of everything I do. Uh, Daily Renegade was created to fight back against social media censorship of our videos and provides a place for us all to watch uh, what we want, say what we want, and have a great fellowship together discussing topics like this that you'll probably never hear in the church. So get every full interview and video that I do, including an upcoming one with Daryl Sims, a.k.a. The Alien Hunter, uh, and much more uh, by heading to dailyrenegade.com, which is linked in the description below, uh, and get a membership, which is only $10 a month or $100 a year. And if you can do it, I suggest getting the 100 a year because uh, it, it is technically cheaper for you in the long run. Essentially, you get two months for free. So the way the website works, our video page works a lot like YouTube, and our community page works a lot like Facebook, just without all the censorship. So you get the best of both worlds there. So uh, please check out dailyrenegade.com, and that link, again, is in the description below. Uh, also, if you sign up right now as this video goes up, that Daryl Sims video is still a couple of days away. That's why I said upcoming, so I just don't want a bunch of people emailing and saying, I can't find the Daryl Sims interview. It will be up there, um, it will be up there as, soon as, uh, as soon as I can conduct the interview and get the video edited and everything. But, but again, if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, you're, you're, you're only going to get the first half of that video. To get the whole video and every entire interview, every entire video that I do, uh, you got to get that at dailyrenegade.com. Um, I'd also encourage you to check out the other links I have in the description, including a link with a promo code to um, the link to a promo code uh, to have access to all presentations of the most recent Prophecy Watchers amazing Prophecy Conference. There's also a link to Cornerstone Asset Metals, the only place that's run by actual Christians that I trust to invest in gold and silver and protect your assets against what's coming in respect to the economy. I highly suggest uh, considering reaching out to them for free information uh, at the link and phone number in the description uh, below. It's just cornerstoneassetmetals.com. And also, if you're viewing this on a different channel and you don't see a link, all of this stuff that I'm talking about right now can be found on the homepage of dailyrenegade.com. I have everything listed there. Uh, lastly, we have a print version of the Dead Sea Scroll calendar developed by Dr. Ken Johnson, which shows the prophetic calendar used by the Essenes of Qumran, who wrote and kept the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the literal calendar that the Bible uses. You can learn about the extra festivals and feasts the Essenes observed, and you can use this as a tool to figure out all those prophetic day counts throughout the Bible. You know, 1290 days, 1260 days, all of these things. Um you know, the five months of the locusts, uh, you, you can even take it back to like the flood of Noah and figure out all those, all those, uh, day counts there. It, it runs through the whole Bible. And you can find that at the link in the description below or just head over to dailyrenegade.com. It's a great study tool, great conversation piece and makes, uh, great gifts. Okay. So let's get back into it. Um, I, I do believe that it's entirely possible that the locusts of Revelation 9 are, uh, extra dimensional and that they're the direct antithesis of the, the cherubim that Ezekiel saw in chapter one of his book. So Ezekiel saw the bad guys, uh, and what's, or, or Ezekiel saw the good guys, excuse me, and then what's described in Revelation nine are the bad guys, uh, essentially. Now, as I pointed out in earlier works, for everything God has, Satan has an evil and inferior duplicate. Satan has never had an original thought of his own, so he borrows from God. And when we look closely at the description of these locusts and compare it to Ezekiel's vision, we see that they're complete opposites. Um, uh, they are most likely described as locusts because of the destructive role that they play, not necessarily because of their physical appearance, but again, there's some, there's some debate on that. Uh, and the, 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 
physical appearance is described in Revelation 9, uh, verse 7, as, uh, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Now, as I show in my book, Cherubim Chariots, the cherubim seem to be an amalgamation of human and animal appearances. Now, other cultures have witnessed these things as well, such as um, uh, the creatures, the, the Lamassu and Shadu of ancient Assyria. And these beings were described as having uh, an animal body, such as, you know, a bull or a lion with the with wings and a human head. But in, in Ezekiel's vision of the cherubim, the good guys, we get the opposite description. Ezekiel describes animal heads atop winged human-like bodies. And we also see in Ezekiel's vision that one of the faces is described as being half human, half lion, uh, possibly bisected vertically. There, there's a case that could be made for that because it says on the on the right and on the left. Um, now in Revelation 9, it states this, and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were the teeth of lions. Now, if they had faces of men, yet teeth of lions, then it would suggest a half human, half lion face, but bisected horizontally rather than vertically. So in Ezekiel's vision, the, the half lion, half human, if we're in, if that's the right interpretation, it's bisected vertically because it says the left and the right. Well, here it, it's the same thing, but it's bisected uh, horizontally because you'd have the, the lion features on the bottom and the human features on top. So it's like a direct inverse. It's it, it, it's 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 a it's an antithesis. Now um, Ezekiel described the heavenly cherubim as carrying the throne of God on top of them. Revelation nine states, and they had, uh, and so so that that's how Ezekiel described it. You know, there's this heavenly cherubim. They have this firmament thing, and then the throne of God's on top. On top. N now let's think about that and read Revelation nine eleven. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Now, that word over, uh, a king over them, that word comes from the Greek word epi, which can mean uh, upon, uh, as well as a as, as well as a statement of, of authority. Um so there are times that the Bible uses this word epi to describe something physically on top of something else without regard to authoritative position. Um, much how the heavenly cherubim were carrying God over them, these fallen cherubim could be carrying uh, their king in a similar way. Um, and their king would be, you know, Apollyon. So again, you know, Satan never has an original thought of his own. He just steals from God and perverts it. Now, as I point out in Cherubim Chariots, I believe that the ancient world had direct contact with fallen cherubim, though they called them things like Lamassu and Shadu. And I believe the book of Revelation is prophesying a return of these fallen creatures. And I also believe if interdimensional contact is made through the use of gravitons, and it could have already been made, we don't know, uh, but it, it could be either these fallen cherubim or the king over them uh, that humanity will be in contact with. And so given that, we could be looking at a modern day repeat of the Tower of Babel and a possible fulfillment of Zechariah 5. But again, uh, for more information on this, check out my uh, books, both uh, Cherubim Chariots and Quantum Creation, available at prophecywatchers.com. Please, if you're going to get any books from me, if you want any of my books, go to prophecywatchers.com and get them there. Um, now, it is exceedingly important for us to keep informed as to what is happening in the world. We will need to provide answers if and when these things take place. And I'm not saying we're going to be here for the tribulation, but we don't know what kind of crazy stuff is going to happen before the tribulation. Uh, and it, it's even better to inform people beforehand anyway. So, you know, we may not be believed at first, but when these things do start to take place... They can help legitimize our claims, uh, even if we're not here anymore. So we also know that we need not fear if we have security in Jesus Christ. So uh, I hope you all have that. And if you if you don't, now would be a good time to get right with the Lord. So uh, I want to thank all of you for joining me. That is all I have for you today. 
And uh, yeah, uh, be looking forward to that Daryl Sims interview coming up soon. And we got lots more um, great stuff. Uh, if you're if you're interested in the calendar that I talked about with Ken Johnson, I do have a recent interview with him. The full interview is available at DailyRenegade.com, and we talk about uh, the timing of the rapture, the Book of Enoch, Dead Sea Scrolls, and and what what they have to say about the rapture and tribulation. It's a fantastic uh, interview. I think you'll get a lot out of it. All right, everybody. Love you all. Till next time. Take care. God bless.